This is Nicholas Dill. Do you need the music? And Nicholas um, just finished his first year of college. Um, he's going to play Pagani 24th Caprice.
sorry. Great job, great job. I should have told you. The black spot, the black spot. I was just realizing as I was playing. <laughs> no, it's okay. But, we've, but, but for our audience, for our audience at home, who's going to watch this, um, we're going to have to play some of that again because it was so, so great, so brilliant. And uh, so I don't know how much the microphones picked up the first time. We'll have you play it again, sure. Um, really wonderful. So uh, I mean, what I really love about what Nicholas is doing is he really captures what I am, I'm sure, a huge aspect of Paganini's personality um, as a performer and therefore as a composer would have been um, his sense of invention. His, um, just his, his sheer imagination. Also a fearlessness, and Nicholas is uncompromising. No, no, I mean, I don't know if he has any fear. Do you, ever, do you have any fears? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, but all, you know, even better, because it's so great that you're not allowing those fears to get in the way of what you want to do. And I'm sure every... Every instinct, every human instinct, kind of screaming inside our head. You know, for non-violins will never understand what it's like to play Paganini. <laughs> you know, it's very noisy in here, right? Um, but it was—it's so wonderful. So you, I'm sure you'll just keep doing that in all the Paganini that you do. Um, just one quick thing that we we did with Nate: uh, try tightening your bow just a little bit, and because this also we want a lot of. We don't want to have to work. There's a lot, lot of quick response, um, even in the articulation of this. But certainly once you get into it, you just want the bow to do it on, on its own. But let's, uh, so play, play again. Actually play the first, the theme in the first three variations. A stem on the, on the black key. Okay, so there's, uh, though, I, I talked about the invention, the fearlessness. There is also, I'm certain, um, another aspect of, of Paganini's playing, though, that I think you can really, really consider, which is the extreme emotion that we, and when you read accounts, you probably have accounts of, of people who went to Paganini's performance is amazing, right? It kind of gives, it, I, I, it gives you chills up your spine when, when you read um, how much he moved people. Um, it's almost like a, a cartoon. You, know, you see, you imagine people fainting and swooning and crying and shouting. And, <laughs> um, and uh, it's just that, that the, um, the affect of what, what he was doing. So um, each variation not only has some kind of different effect, but the resultant emotion um, because of that. So let's say, um, now, oh, actually, Nate, we were talking about um, 
things that, in terms of character, kind of lie close to the middle of the spectrum. This theme is like that, right? Um, I would say it's incredibly dark. Um, and it's very high-spirited, but it's certainly not bright, right? Um, but from there, the variations start to really take on clear characters. And, um, just to tell us variation one. How do, and all themes and variations, um, a really great way of thinking about it is how the variation compares to the theme, not necessarily taking the variation just on its own. So variation one, what he wrote, compared to the theme, Okay. Playful. Playful, okay, can you play that? It's not just that it sounds brilliant, but all the emotion, um, I mean, the, the sounds, and therefore the emotion, it's, he, he knew, it was kind of like Mozart writing for every instrument. He knew exactly how to bring out, what to write in order to bring out that emotion, right? So one perspective with Paganini is just play it hear every note come out and trust that if we hear every note, um, then the emotion does come out. So you have all the, great, all the right intentions. We're not quite hearing every note, though. Okay, can, you, can you try to bring that? Actually, let's do it as an exercise. Play it maybe um, quite slow, like Hear each note come out, but with the character that you want. Okay, okay, good. That didn't sound so playful now. <laughs> Now, I, I realize there's some technical issues going on here. Um, this is with string crossings. We're, we are, this is this weird, again, non-string players will never understand, never appreciate this, but here we are, we're, we're trying to move our, our, our bow this way, and therefore our arm, but we're also moving our arm this way, right? So our brain says, move our arm, but when we do this, we stop moving this way as well. <laughs> so what we have to do is, as you change strings, make sure you're still moving horizontally, that you're using bow. So um, what if this, this time actually try also, just stare at your bow and decide on a certain amount of bow, maybe, I don't know, that much on each note, um, and just make sure you use that much bow on each note especially the last couple of notes. It's better already, especially the last note, okay? The sixth note of the groups. Um, use, so a good way of practicing everything, anything in general is, so right now you're not using enough bow, right? Use the most bow. So it, it's not going to sound exactly how you want, but it's a really great kind of physical trick. Okay, good. And this is also a great chance when you're doing it slowly to really figure out where you are in the bow. Um, when we're doing it slowly, we can do it anywhere, right? But we can't do it anywhere <laughs> in tempo. So we want to try to figure out where that, where the balance point is, um, where we don't have to 
work to make, make it articulate. Good, that's better. Do it one more time with that last note. Good. And let's use, you know, this is, this is where we get into how beautifully Paganini wrote. This is also something to remember. Paganini wrote not necessarily the caprices because we you know, probably, presumably, didn't perform all of them in public. But, um, but still, his, his orientation. This was how he made his living. He played this, right? In addition to being just an incredible artist, changing the world with, with all of this that he invented, he also had to perform in public. And if you were Paganini and you had to make a living playing your own pieces, you're not going to write pieces that you have to practice for two years, right? <laughs> right? You're going to work with the vocabulary you have. And presumably that means things that come idiomatically on the violin. So let's not confuse difficult or intimidating or uh, very uh, you know, difficult because things are moving so quickly with awkward. Actually, most Paganini is not very awkward if you are playing it kind of in the way he imagined. So what's beautiful about this is we can use that last, that last note to get to the next thing. bow on that but it's like you're doing that but then you're not ready for it Dude, let's just do that that's how you want it. you want it to feel like a pickup actually ultimately you want the entire thing to feel like a pickup so That's actually also just generally a trick. When we think something is leading somewhere, our arm doesn't hit that wall. Okay. Um, now, this is just a, a, a general issue that we are, and this is all, all performers are dealing with, um, including us as violinists, especially when we're playing Paganini, is we are... You know, there's what's going on in our head, there's our imagination, and then the next issue is the realization of that imagination, right? And we want, probably, you have this imagination, and, and unless you're you know, just playing in a room by yourself in a vacuum, you're performing for people, and you want people to perceive what you're doing in a certain way, right? So not only do we have to have this incredible imagination and just try to do, trying to realize it, um, but we also have to uh, reserve a, a certain amount of our listening and our brain and our imagination actually, putting it out there, for how it's coming out, actually coming out, right? So. Um, so that's something that I think that's also the aspect that you can work on. Try the next, you got a little gum with this. And again, that, like a moderate tempo like that. And see if you can pretend you are one of our audience members and you're watching yourself play, you're listening to yourself play, and you're hearing yourself. It's kind of bizarre, right? You're hearing yourself play the sounds that you imagine. That's great, it's better. 
in, in the Ponticello, I love that effect, by the way, um, it, it's very clear, your attention, but I lost all those little notes. Better, can you tell, you're the audience member now, can you tell which notes Nicholas is playing that are not coming out as much? In the Ponticello, can you tell? Not very well from here. Not so much? Okay. Da 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 It's the last three notes or so of, of that. That's right. Nate, you're sitting the furthest, right? Is that Nate over there? Yeah. <laughs> Could you hear that better? First time, yeah. Second time was a little harder to hear. Oh, this time it was harder to hear. No, as in he does it. Oh, 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 I see, I see. Okay, okay, try it one more time. Okay, now there's one more aspect we always have to consider as performers, which is we're communicating to them over there and it's the acoustic gets in the way, right? Actually, in here, it's a, it has a nice, there's a nice resonance to it. The sound doesn't have any problem getting out there but the echo of my voice is getting in my own way, right? So, and, and that is actually, that is um, true of a lot of resonant halls. The more your sound is ringing, the more great ringing tone you're making, it gets in the way of the next note. So we almost, almost always, we just have to think slower. The more note, this is, and this is ironic about Paganini, the more notes you have, the slower you have to think, and then it's going to sound the way you want. Okay, so play this once more. Imagination, the, the timing, um, the sound, all of those things, the same, except just a little slower. Does it sound slow? Yeah. It, it's, it still sounds pretty fast, right? Yeah. It, to think also with Paganini. Bach also. There's so much happening so quickly. It's confusing for us. It's overwhelming, actually. So um, it, Paganini, in general, I would say, just doesn't need to be so fast. It will feel fast. We want it to feel fast. But in order for it to feel fast, we need to hear everything. And hear all the figurations, and uh, I mean, I sound like my teachers when I was a student, and just trying to burn through through everything. And I always said, "No, it's too fast. It's too fast." And then I would slow it. Finally, slow it down. And then they said, "Wow, that is more exciting." It was, and I didn't believe them at first because I felt like I'm not really working. Also, you're more relaxed. It's a very good kind of <laughs> sequence of events. So. Um, so work with that. When you find something, this, is, this goes the, the same as kind of exaggerating motions. When you find you're, uh, you're not using enough bow, use more bow. Same thing with speed. If you find you're rushing things, just slow down those notes. Just as a practice tool. And then just with a little time, your normal will be just in, in time. You were just hurrying them a little bit. Um, try the, uh, your pizzicato is amazing. <laughs> do, do it more. Uh, but also, just a little too fast. Oh, just a bit. <laughs> but play, play, the last thing we can do is this. Okay, try to hear every single note out there.
Nate, again, I'm just gonna, I'm asking you because you're the furthest. And usually when there's more distance, it's even, it's harder to hear. Does that sound slow? No. <laughs> Not at all, right? <laughs> and this is, it's a strange disconnect with, with Paganini. Um, I still experience it. I'm, I'm still shocked. Um, just, a, um, I don't know, recently I was, I was playing the Caprices and I had my wife listening to the dress rehearsal and I played number one and she said, it's too fast, I can't hear it. So I played slower, she said, no, it's still too fast. I play, I mean, I, I thought, I wanted it to sound something like, okay, so I mean on the mic, that's, it probably sounds like how I want. Out there, it just sounded faster. And finally, when I, I was something like, she said, wow, that sounds so clear and so fast. It was, it was weird. But then you actually start to enjoy that feeling of not being so stressed. So bravo, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Yeah, bravo, bravo. <laughs>